Welcome to Keeping the World Company on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about Israel's defense against Hezbollah and how it's heating up. Will we see retaliation? We're seeing it. Will we see repetition? We're seeing it. Or will we see both? Yes. Our guest for the show is Gene Rosenfeld, independent scholar. Welcome to the show, Gene. Thank you, Jay. Let's break this down. It's one of the most complex and dynamic issues on the world stage right now. So maybe we ought to talk first. Why don't we talk first about Hezbollah? What is it? How did it get there? What does it represent? How much control does it have? How much support does it have from Iran? And what is its future? Can you talk about those things? A little. Hezbollah, party of God is what it means in Arabic, uh, is an organization that was formed around 1982, 1983 uh, in Lebanon, shortly after the PLO was driven out of Lebanon. People for, forget perhaps, or maybe have been born since uh, 1982, 83, when uh, we had airplane hijackings by the PLO and Black September. Uh, we had the Marine barracks bombing in 1983 that uh, Ronald Reagan uh, on his watch, happened on his watch and pulled Marines out of Beirut. There was a civil war in 1983 in Lebanon. And when the PLO left, Hezbollah formed and took its place. Many of the people that were involved in the Marine barracks bombing and the hijackings of airplanes became part of Hezbollah. And one of them, Fuad Shukr, who was assassinated by Israel just recently, was uh, one of the planners of the Marine Barracks bombing. Israel went into Lebanon in 1982. It went into the refugee camps there and uh, tried to root out PLO terrorists. And since that time, the border, the northern border of Israel has been unstable. There have been periodic hot wars between Hezbollah, which basically took over the government of Lebanon. It dominates the government of Lebanon, despite the fact that Hezbollah is an Islamist Shia organization aligned with Iran, and there are more Christians in Lebanon than any other country in the Middle East. When Arab states became more nationalistic. Jews had to leave and go to Israel, and Christians gathered in Lebanon. Nevertheless, there is this organization, very much like Hamas in Gaza, that has its thumb over the populace and government of Lebanon. And the individual civilians are embedded um, with Hezbollah, or rather Hezbollah is embedded with them. There's a southern uh, suburb of Beirut that is the headquarters of Hezbollah. But when you attack the headquarters of Hezbollah, you also have civilian casualties. And they have tunnels under Beirut as well as they do in Gaza. It's the same playbook as Hamas in Gaza and the same type of organization. This is what Israel is facing. And right after October 7th, Hezbollah attacked Israel again, drove 67,000 Israeli residents out of northern Israel next to the border and Galilee, and attacked, of course, some children on a soccer field and killed them. Um, and Israel finds this uh, an existential issue. Its people cannot go back to their homes in northern Israel. And the southern part of Lebanon is also armed and uh, full of soldiers from Hezbollah, which has a very large military and is a proxy of Iran. Hezbollah is also in Syria, where it's helping to prop up the Shiite government that's been oppressing uh, it's Sunni people for a very long time. So we're talking about a really ugly organization here that is 
uh, completely embedded and has amassed missiles and has been sending missiles over Israel uh, for, well, since 1982. Yeah, you know, the, the relationship of Hezbollah and the people of Lebanon uh, sounds similar to the relationship of Hamas and the people of, Pal of the Palestinians in Gaza, in the sense that uh, Hamas controls the Palestinians. They are mm, the elected officials, but also if you want to disagree with Hamas, they'll kill you. Uh, and I think the same thing is happening or has been happening uh, in Lebanon. Um, not only mm, do they control the Lebanese, the people in Lebanon, um, Palestinians and otherwise, um, but it, the whole community is part of Hezbollah. That's why Israel had no reluctance in going after the whole community, because the whole community is Hezbollah. Um, but I think, too, it's worth noting how big Hezbollah is. Hezbollah has more money, more weapons, more sophistication, more organization uh, uh, than Hamas, right? It is a big deal, isn't it? It is a big deal. I also want to point out the differences, though, in this comparison between Hezbollah and Hamas. Hamas came out of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, which is a Sunni jihadist organization like Al Qaeda. The big divide in the Middle East between the northern and southern Arab countries is between the Shia religion and or denomination and the Sunni denomination. The Sunni are the majority denomination of Islam throughout the world. And the headquarters of Islam, the center of Islam is Mecca in Saudi Arabia, which is ruled by a very fundamentalist Sunni sect, the Wahhabis. The northern tier of states now is Shiite, and they are in basically a war against the Sunni. That's why Saudi Arabia is being attacked by the Houthis because in uh, Yemen, because Yemen is now a proxy of Iran. So this is part of the Iran uh, Saudi Arabia struggle. And we lose sight of that when we look at, we drill down and we only look at these particular proxy organizations of Hamas and Hezbollah. Both of them are aligned with Iran, but Hezbollah is Shia. It is the minority denomination in Islam that it's at war with the Sunni. And also the population of Lebanon is really being held, you might say, hostage to Hezbollah because it's Christian and Druze and other and Sunni, but it is not Shiite for the most part. And these Shia uh, terrorists have embedded themselves with this population. So they're not. No, they don't want them, but they can't overpower them because they have a huge military. With Gaza, on the other hand, the Palestinians are the same denomination as Hamas, but Hamas is Islamist, it's jihadist. It's not as forward-thinking, educated, and modern as the Gazans. So there is tension between them, yes, but it's not as great as it is in Lebanon. No, the common denominator seems to be that the mission of Hezbollah is akin to the mission of Hamas, that is, um, to destroy Israel, to destroy the Jews, to fight the West uh, from the river to the sea. Am I right? Both have pledged and have written documents that is, are evidence for this, that they want to eradicate Israel. And if you eradicate Israel, think about what that means. It means the ethnic cleansing of Jews from the Middle East completely, because they are no longer really a presence in any Arab country in the Middle East. The people of the Middle East who are Jewish and have been there for 2,000 years, in some cases, have had to find refuge in Israel, which is their only refuge. And people forget this because you see, Hamas and the jihadis and the um, Iranian proxies have been very active in preparing a propaganda story narrative that they've been very successful in sending to teachers in the United States. 
states, in the universities. We know these packets have arrived right after October 7th. And I've seen some of this stuff that it's, it's purely Hamas propaganda. Just like during the 1930s in Los Angeles, we had the protocols of the elders of Zion that came from Russia, this story about uh, Jews uh, ruling the world and ruling the educational system. And it was being disseminated to teachers in Los Angeles. There's an archive at the Simon Weisenthal Museum in Los Angeles, which shows some of these materials that in some cases were dropped from the top of very high buildings as leaflets. So we're seeing a, a resurgence of propaganda, but this time people are not aware that it's propaganda because they really don't know the history of Hezbollah and Hamas. Mm. So why, why, Gene? Why does Iran want to spread this kind of hate? Why does Iran want to fund and support and provide weapons to all of these proxy terror groups in order to destroy Israel and destroy the Jews? What, what, what motivates them? Israel is such a small country in a much larger region. You know, Iran is many, many, many times the size of Israel, for example. The population there is 90 million Israel, you know, uh, and including all the diverse groups is something around 6 million, I think. The pro so the problem is, uh, I just don't understand why we have these people who continue, these terror groups who continue, and Iran that continues to try to destroy the Jews, who are not attacking them. All these wars that have happened since 1948 have been wars against Israel, not by Israel. Um, why is this happening? Well, let's look at Iran. In 1979, uh, the Iranian king was overthrown and the mullahs uh, came into power. They were Shiite leaders. and. Shia means minority. The Shia party always has had this name in Arabic as being the minority and the victim and the oppressed among the larger Sunni majority. There was um, a dispute uh, in Islam right after the prophet died among who his successors would be in the caliphate. And the minority party, the Shia, um, did not win. Their, their, their leaders were relatives of Muhammad, and they were, um, they were martyred. And so their celebrations are celebrations of their martyrdom, just as Christians celebrate the martyrdom of Jesus. So there are some similarities <laughs> between Christianity and Shia Islam. And, you know, they have a lot to complain about over uh, the last 1,500 years. They, they really have suffered. Um, but today, it's part of the whole big geopolitical split in the world. Iran is a, an ally of Russia. Russia has designs in the Middle East. We know that. The northern tier is a buffer between Russia and the southern tier of Arab states who are aligned with the West, Egypt, uh, uh, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, uh, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Israel are aligned with the United States and their Sunni powers. They were just about to make a historic peace agreement before October 7th. It's one of the reasons why Hamas staged its attack on Israel at that time was to prevent the peace agreement between Saudi Arabia and Israel. It would have made a huge difference and brought peace to the Middle East, but they, they scuttled that. Now Iran is trying to maintain its control over Iraq and Lebanon and Syria and itself, and Russia is supporting it. And also Iran is providing Russia with drones for its war in Ukraine. Russia is opposed to the West. In 1979, the Iranians took our diplomats hostage, brought down um, the presidency, the second presidency potentially of Jimmy Carter. And um, 
it's been an anti-Western uh, beginning to the whole modern religious terrorism that has started out since 1979. So Iran is historic in that, but we have to even go back further. Iran was the head of the greatest empire in the Middle East, Persia. Iran is Persia. And it was at the border of Rome in Israel. Israel was the most outlying province of the Greco-Roman Empire. And it faced right up against Persia. And Persia dominated that part of the world. There is a national pride in Iran of itself as a hegemon in that part of the world. And in order to be a hegemon again, it has to dominate Mecca, dominate Saudi Arabia, get rid of the Jews, get rid of the West and what the West stands for, reinstate strict um, Shia Islam and uh, fulfill its destiny as a great power. And it can only do this with Russia behind it. That's pretty threatening. That that violates any notion of a liberal world order, doesn't it? It, <laughs> it speaks of violence. It speaks of uh, violations of sovereignty, hither and yon. It, uh, it speaks of hatred and, and genocide. That's what it speaks of. Uh, I, I just don't understand why the average person in the street in Tehran will support that. But I guess they do, don't they? I don't think so. I think the average person in the street in Tehran particularly the women, would like to see Iran come into the modern world, get rid of the mullahs. It has an elected president right now who's pretty liberal. He just gave a speech at the United Nations, opening Iran to peace and prosperity. And when he said that, he was then forced the next day to take it back because the mullahs didn't like what he said. And he was elected by the people of Iran. This is huh? Uh, that poor guy, he, you know, he's uh, kind of, uh, he's the good cop against the bad cop. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the mullahs are the bad cop and he plays the good cop, but ultimately they rule. So not, not so good. And that means that ultimately they will attack Israel. And let's, let's talk about the modern, modern day events that have happened. Uh, why did Israel wait so long? Uh, to try to regain um, the homes, the Israeli homes at the border, uh, where 67,000 people used to live, uh, where 10 or 20 miles have been rendered fallow um, by all the, these attacks with missiles and drones and what have you. Uh, why did they wait? They waited for a year. Israel has been fighting a two-front war for a year. Hezbollah started raining the missiles down and cleansing northern Israel of people right on October 9th or so, or I think maybe October 23rd is when they actually started. Gaza was in progress at that point in process. Israel first had been surprised by the Gaza attack, had suffered a tremendous setback had to organize a strategy and a military campaign that was one of the most difficult types of military campaigns you could possibly start. And it was delayed because the United States in particular, but other countries aligned with the United States and the United Nations wanted Israel not to invade Gaza. You recall that. So the Israelis waited for a couple of months before they did that. And when they went in, they told the people of northern Gaza, they warned them to flee. That's in accord with Jewish just war rules, that you warn people, you give them, you open the back door, you let them out. Unfortunately, Gaza is a bounded space, and you can only move the pieces around the board. You can't get them off the board. Jordan doesn't want them. King Abdullah just said no to the Palestinians as refugees. Egypt didn't want them. Egypt wanted to police its border and didn't want Palestinian refugees. They have taken in a few of the families that have, uh, you know, people that needed uh, medical care and so forth. But in general, the Gazans are trapped, so they can only be moved around. It's really, really awful because it's urban warfare where Hamas is firing rockets from 
civilian sites where they can go underground at three to 400 miles of tunnels that they've built underground, which of course is where the hostages are being held in horrible conditions. And the Israelis are fighting a war of, a, of their to exist. Also at the same time after October 23rd and the attacks raining down on them um, from the North, from Hezbollah, who are in alignment with a plan for a year and a half with Hamas in Beirut uh, as the so-called axis of resistance. They planned this campaign, which they call Al-Aqsa Al -Aqsa flood or Al-Aqsa storm. This is a military planned campaign by Iranian asymmetrical organizations and proxies um, that are both Sunni and Shia terrorist groups. Hamas, Hezbollah, Palestinian, uh, Islamic Jihad. There are entities on the West Bank that have also been um, inactive, have been, been active. What's going on the West on the West Bank is a different story, however. I won't get into that. And there's a lot there that, that is very complicated. But Israel couldn't really prosecute this war against Hezbollah until it could get to a certain point with Hamas. And secondly, they knew they were going up against the superior army, an army that in 2006, the last hot war between Hezbollah and Israel, really they fought Israel to a standstill. And that was very frightening to Israel. Well, so Israel decides now that it has to make an attack um, on the southern the southern areas of Lebanon. Why now? What what led to that attack? What led to the um, the violence that's happening right now? Well, first of all, the sixty seven thousand Israelis uh, who can't go back home in Galilee and northern Israel, uh, it's unsustainable. I mean, they have nowhere to go. And Israel can't put up with that. It wants to, it can't allow, it can't allow Hezbollah to steal a march on Israeli territory. It can't ethnically cleanse an area of Israel and allow that to stand. So they have to confront Hezbollah and, and regain their territory. That's their main reason. The second reason is that they know that this is a tough army and who fought them to a standstill the last time, that they have missiles, that they are being supplied by Iran, and that they have control in Syria as well, which also borders Israel on the Golan Heights. So they're, they're fighting the tougher, tougher guys now. Mm, yeah. So, uh, what, can you can you give me some context on on the pager and cell phone attack? Oh wow, wasn't that something? Uh, yeah. Well, of course, when you read our newspapers, uh, it it says that twenty five hundred people were uh, injured and. I believe first it was nine, and now I think it's more like 17 people died. And yes, there were civilians and children who were injured and killed, but that's a minority. Most of those pagers were in the hands of Hezbollah sympathizers. And I heard one story that the reason why they were activated at that time was that they were about to, the Israeli uh, plan was about to be exposed and they, they had, it was now or never. I don't know how true that is. Or maybe it was just a way to weaken and terrify Hezbollah before they went in uh, to confront Hezbollah in Lebanon, in, in northern Israel and southern Lebanon. Well, the first reaction was, uh, in my view, a, a propaganda war. Uh, here the Israelis go again, killing all these people, wounding all these people, including children. 
And that was almost immediately. So they know how to do propaganda. And the first thing they do is uh, propaganda against the Israelis for what they mm, describe as, uh, you know, atrocities. Um, but I, I just uh, I wonder whether the press has done a good job in educating people, not only there, but here and everywhere um, on, on the background and on you know, uh, the fact that this is not uh, atrocity at all. This is self-defense. Have, has the, do you think the, the press has done a good job in, um, in educating people on what is going on? Of course, first, what is going on in Gaza, but second, now, again, in Lebanon. I have read some excellent articles, and I think I would put at the top of the list if you want to know more about Lebanon and its government and Hezbollah and the rise of Hezbollah and its conflicts with Israel. One of the very best articles I have read recently was published on July 29th in the New Yorker magazine by Dexter Filkins, who is a prominent journalist uh, on Hezbollah and Lebanon. He went to Lebanon. He quotes uh, Hezbollah operatives and leaders whom he interviewed. Um, he gives a background in history on Lebanon, and that's really must reading for most Americans. On the other hand, the local press here and around our country, they're very, they're as uninformed as most of us are on this. I have just spent the last month providing a close friend uh, with information. He's a desktop publisher. He's a um, very, very intelligent uh, person and uh, stays abreast of all the news. And he didn't know most of the facts I have just recounted here because we just don't know the facts because the press isn't there really to educate us. The press is there to report the news in the contemporary scene, not necessarily to analyze or give background, although the best newspapers and outlets do that. And they do it in a non-biased way. But we also know that with the advent of social media and the internet, we now have very biased sources and people kind of limit themselves to what they, the, the biases that they already feel comfortable with. So no, we don't have the press as an educator. And unfortunately, just as in the 1930s, the anti-Semites from Russia sent uh, propaganda to teachers first in Los Angeles. So now are we getting these prepared propaganda packets from Hamas uh, in the universities. Columbia University has just come out with its second report on the protests and hostilities and anti-Semitism that it's endured this past year. And that second report is very, very informative on how to combat anti-Semitism on our campuses because it's a direct result of the Hamas propaganda that has been prepared for quite some time. And the BDS movement, which harkens back to the 1990s and the rhetoric that's being appropriated from the Cold War and the South African conflict into this conflict, misconceiving the, the comparisons and the ideas and the, the concepts that we need to, to consider uh, in the Middle East. The Middle East is a has its own separate history, trajectory, religious conflict, and we need to, we need to educate ourselves. Well, back to uh, Lebanon for a minute. Um, seems like the uh, the the pager incident um, was intended to disrupt um, command control communications among the members of Hezbollah, and probably did do some of that. But as you said, uh, they they fought uh, Israel to a standstill back in the 90s, um, and they're strong. Uh, what I find also interesting is they apparently asked Iran to step in and help them, you know, and help them reorganize after the pager incident and fight with Israel. But 
um, so far, Iran has Iran has de, de, you know declined to do that, according to Brzezhkin in his remarks to the United Nations. But that's only right now, and that could change, and Iran could get involved in a um, a, a war back against Israel, uh, emerging out of all this violence. I imagine it is not a good time for to be in Lebanon. The um, the air flights have been limited, curtailed, maybe stopped altogether. I wouldn't want to be a Christian in Lebanon right now. Um, and I think um, you know the Hezbollah has really taken taken control. On the other hand, uh, Israel has knocked out a lot of targets, and they have tried to destroy the munitions uh, stores that. Uh, Iran has provided to the Hezbollah, and um, the, the, you know it's really anybody's guess how this is going to unfold. Will Israel be able to fight them and keep them off its border, uh, or will they come down and do some sort of um, retributive counterattack on Israel? It, it, it seems like it's right at the balance right now, at an inflection point of some kind. Yeah. And so uh, Hezbollah is trying to reorganize itself. Israel is trying to stop it from reorganizing itself. And all Israel wants them to do is stay out of Israeli land and, and let the, the, the people who live there at the northern border, the Israelis, go back, including including cities and towns that were Arab, by the way, I should mention. They, they've also been neutralized by Hezbollah. So my question to you is, where is, where is this going, Gene? It's, it doesn't sound like a happy time. Um, on the other hand, let me let me offer the thought that it it does it doesn't sound like anything that Israel can avoid. Israel must do this. It must defend its borders. Um, it must attack people who are going to violate its borders. And we don't know where this is going to wind up. Do you have any ideas about that? Well, you know, Saudi Arabia is being very very quiet, isn't it? The United Nations is is very, very worried and is with the United States is putting together a peace plan for Lebanon, between Lebanon and Israel. The people in Lebanon are very frightened and very impacted. Beirut is being bombed. Uh, they don't have an adequate defense system against bombing and missiles like Israel does. Iran is on the back foot right now, but it's biding its time. It continues to say it is going to retaliate on Israel for the death of Ismail uh, Hania, the head of Hezbollah who was in Iran at the time that he was targeted and assassinated by Israel a couple months ago. So they are perhaps as shocked as Israel was on October 7th by the cell phone um, attack. The, it wasn't cell phones, pardon me. It was pagers and walkie-talkies. Um, and, and that was meant to uh, sow caution and disarray while Israel got its act together. But now Hezbollah is trying to regroup. And Iran is contemplating its actions. Saudi Arabia, of course, is sitting this out. It doesn't want to expend its military capital, and it doesn't want to attract hostilities. Um, it is being pressured by the United States and allies to please uh, try to do something with the Houthis in Yemen on its, its southern tip there in the peninsula. But the Houthis are kind of quiet now, too. So we're all just taking a deep breath. It's like the calm before the storm. But yes, both President Biden, who spoke at the United Nations uh, a couple days ago, and the president of the United Nations have called this an inflection point for the Middle East. It is really, we're on the cusp of what the world has worried about for 80 years, and that is a wider war. Joe Biden has been dragging his heels with regard to providing weapons or permission to the Ukrainians for, to use weapons into Russia. And there's pressure on him now from all kinds of places, including some 
of the countries of uh, NATO. But he hasn't he hasn't done it yet. He's kind of been a master at uh, at delay, and uh, that's sad because if you look back year, years from now, you would have to say that he, he was um, he was he was not helping by dragging his heels for how long already for two years. Um, now, if we look at Israel, he's been trying to do um, trying to discourage Israel from attacks trying to discourage Israel from, including defensive attacks. He's been trying to discourage Israel from a larger war, and he's been trying to broker deals. He's spent an enormous amount of time brokering deals. What's his legacy going to look like here? Um, you know, I suggest that his legacy right now, in my view, is not so great. I mean, we, we look back at Afghanistan, we look at what's happened in uh, in uh, Ukraine, and now he's talking peace deals when Israel is defending itself from an existential threat on the north again. Um, how does how does Joe Biden look these days? Beleaguered, <laughs> as he should be, but it's not just Joe Biden who's beleaguered. We stepped into a leadership role, rightly or wrongly. We're still in that role, and we're being attacked by Russia and China and Iran and North Korea uh, by the gang of four <laughs> against us. Uh, that That's deliberate also. He's trying to hold the line in Ukraine because every time uh, it looks like Ukraine is gaining the upper hand. Russia plays the nuclear card, and they just did again. Putin enlarged his concept of a nuclear retaliation. He, he loosened it to include, quote, any country which delivers the means to Ukraine to attack Russia further inland. So that he's saying that if we give Zelensky the missiles that Zelensky wants in order for them to attack Russian targets further afield, he will hold us responsible and um, consider a nuclear response. Zelensky is warning that Russia is going to try to shut down three nuclear plants in Ukraine that provide necessary heat and power to the Ukrainian people. 80% of Ukrainian power has been shut down by Russia and they're facing a very tough winter. So once again, we have to consider, is Putin bluffing? Does he really mean it when he says he would escalate? These are the kinds of things that an, give an American president nightmares. Do we want a president who would consider that that this is a card game and that Putin is bluffing? Or do we want him to exercise caution and look at this contest as between Ukraine and Russia and not the United States and Russia? Because once it becomes the United States and Russia, then we really are at an inflection point in a much greater way. So I would say that he has been a very rational leader. And you can't always, on the spur of the moment or in the thick of the battle, know whether whatever decision you make is going to tip the scales or tip you back on your heels. So exercising caution is part of it because his job, his primary job as president of the United States is to protect the American people. So I think, <laughs> what were the alternatives? What if Donald Trump had been president these past three and a half to four years? What would, be, what would we be facing now? Um, what would be happening in Europe, in Ukraine, with Russia, with the right wing? In Europe, would 
Russia have succeeded in its plan to overthrow United States leadership in the world by now? Would we have just caved and gone to ground and, and retreated into our continental isolationism? And how would that have worked out in four more years? One way or another, we are skirting the possibility of a major World War III, a kinetic war. And as long as we don't have that, or we're not descending into that, I would say any president has done a really amazing job. Well, that's if you believe Putin. You know, the, the, uh, the BRICS meeting is going to happen soon. And guess where it's happening? It's happening in Russia. Uh, and uh, the guy who's setting it up is Putin. And one of the very interesting uh, points on the agenda is, is whether to go to a global gold standard uh, in order to try to undermine the U.S. dollar. I mean, he is at war with us on everything, everything. And he's trying to get allies. You know, we try to get allies. He tries to get allies. And he's got a number of people, a number of countries who are his allies. He, he's never going to stop. So at the end of the day, you know, there are two ways to have war, kinetic and hybrid, and he's fighting them both. Um, and, and so any American president who wants to avoid the results that, um, that Putin is seeking has to look on both sides of that, kinetic and the threats and hybrid and the propaganda. Anyway, I wanted to ask you one more question about Israel before we go. What would happen if Trump were elected? He's promised support for Israel. How would that change things? How would that change things on the northern border with Hezbollah? How would that change things in Gaza? One Israeli I talked to said, all we have to do is stop the war in Gaza, and Hezbollah would stop attacking us. All we have to do is stop the war in Gaza. And uh, Hamas would release all the all the hostages. Do you believe any of that? No, I don't. <laughs> as far as what Trump would do, he would be in a dilemma because, on the one hand, uh, Trump has been a supporter of Netanyahu when it suited him, by the way, and of Israel's. Uh, warlike stance against its neighbors. And by the way, I, I don't think that Likud has gone about the last 40 or so years very wisely myself. It's boxed itself into a corner with only one tool in the toolkit, and that is military might. And had it done other things along the way or started its sole response to the Gaza incursion differently, I think we'd be in a different place right now. And it would be cooperating with its major US ally. I mean. To be very honest with you, Israel will go under if the United States does not support it. And that's why we have to support Israel. But that doesn't mean we have to like what's going on. Netanyahu and Biden are shouting at each other now. They're not really talking. Because mm, they really are at opposite ends of the political spectrum. And, yeah. the, um, and, the, and the guy that we're talking to is Yoav Gallant, the minister of defense, I believe. And he's a tough guy, but he's a rational person. He's not beholden to the extremists in Netanyahu's cabinet. Netanyahu has to do what the extremists want because otherwise his government will fall. Gallant doesn't have to worry about that. So our military is working with their military in Gallant. And the IDF isn't totally behind Netanyahu either. So Israel's trying to fight this war with its hands it's governmental hands tied behind its back because it's split politically. Netanyahu, I believe, would his government would have fallen by now if Gaza had not attacked. But Trump doesn't know much about any of this. And anybody that he hires at this time is going to be a yes man to a person who knows nothing. So we're going to be in really dire straits if he tries to manage a crisis. He's basically going to let Israel do what it wants, I think. But then he has a problem because Russia doesn't want Israel to do what it wants. Russia wants to, is playing the Iran card. 
And Iran is the enemy of Israel. So what's Trump going to do? I mean, what's he going to do with Putin? If he's going to let Putin do what he wants, and he's going to let Netanyahu do what he wants, he's basically going to retreat into Fortress America, and we're going to be isolated. We will lose our leadership in the world. We may go on the gold standard because this is what Russia has been planning. It's a policy called it, um, Eurasianism. And we are the enemy. We are the Atlantics. And they are trying to garner uh, friends among the global south, as opposed to our alliances in the Asia Pacific area and Europe. So <laughs> the world is dividing into two armed camps. And if Trump were president, he would cave and withdraw. And Russia would get its way. I'd just like to add two points before we go. One is that uh, this past week, Russia has overflown Japan with military aircraft three times. Um, that surprised me. I would have expected, you know, more likely China. But no, this is not China. This is Russia flying over Japan. That's a long way from Russia. The second point is that uh, Hezbollah has managed to fire missiles into Tel Aviv. The, yeah. the capital, the capital city of Israel. Now they were shot down by by anti anti missile defenses in Israel, but this is the first time I can remember, Jane, um, that they've actually uh, fired a missile that would have hit Tel Aviv itself. So talk about inflection points. We are in a more dangerous situation by far than we were prior to October seventh last year. It's not just Tel Aviv. It, they fired it at the headquarters of Mossad, <laughs> the Israeli military. <laughs> and if that had been a direct hit, that would have been something. Um, yeah, we are we are facing an inflection point on November 5th, guys. And if Trump gets in, uh, it'll be a very different world. And you might make some other plans for yourself and the rest and your kids. I wouldn't put two cents on on Trump's leadership at all, given the enemies we have today and the way we need to hold the line. If we want any semblance of peace, protection, security, um, we are going to have to hold the line against uh, Russian adventurism. Japan is rearming. They're doing, they're being magnificent allies for the Asia Pacific area. Japan is a historic enemy of Russia. They conquered Siberian territory in 1905. My grandfather was in that war. Russia, of course, is very wary of Japan rearming because Japan has defeated them before. Now, Russia has the greatest military next to the United States, even though it's a weak economy compared to China. China has the great economy. Russia has the great military. China's building up as fast as it can. But Russia is very threatened by Japan rearming. Thank you, Jean. Jean Rosenfeld, independent scholar, helping us bring together all these threads and threats. I look forward to our next discussion, Jean. Aloha. Thank you, Jane. Aloha.